uh, as David actually mentioned, I'm the manager for the Math for Secure Communication. It's a certificate that many sort of actually uh, will take uh, while they are at MPS and they have some, uh, um, you know, inclination for uh, cryptography. It is comprised of four courses, discrete math, algebra number theory, which is our prerequisites for the meat of the uh, program, namely cryptography and coding theory. So, um, of course, we, besides the uh, teaching aspect, we do a lot of research in, um, in uh, private and public key systems and also coding theory. Interestingly, coding theory is mostly done not by the mathematician, rather by the EC people, computer scientists, but we have also uh, our hands uh, in um, coding theory. But crypto is mostly done here. Now, various aspects besides uh, pub public and private key, uh, we do research in uh, networks and graphs, and we also have uh, game theory. Uh, Guillermo actually is uh, well known. He actually was, in fact, um, uh, nominated for Nobel Prize a few years back. Um, he didn't get it, but uh, it's uh, quite a bit, uh, you know, quite a big accomplishment uh, as far as that is concerned. I have plenty of uh, personal interest, uh, more from the uh, theoretical aspect of mathematics up to more applied area. Uh, number theory, combinatorial discrete math, crypto and Boolean functions, and coding theory. Now, since I am in California, you know, the mecca of movies, um, we uh, design the movie. The science of secrecy and the protection of information has determined the direction of human events since the beginning of civilization. The success of messages traveling from senders to receivers has had the potential to empower or destroy. Over time, the knowledge of how to protect information grew as it altered the course of history and transformed landscapes from rock to towering empires. Caesar used this knowledge to conquer the world. Mary, Queen of Scots, underestimated it in a failed coup and fell victim to its sway. In World War II, the Nazis wreaked havoc until the secrets of their Enigma machine were discovered. In 2008, Russia used the power of secret information to unleash cyber war on Georgia. Today, you can unlock the secrets of cryptology through the Secure Communication Certificate Program, offered by the Applied Mathematics Department at the Naval Postgraduate School. Okay. Um, I actually designed this. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's available online, but uh, enough of the nonsense, so let me go on to the today's topic. Um, just to give you a glimpse on how difficult these things are. I mean, why do we need mathematicians? We have so many systems out there, you know, with various key sizes. Uh, why do we need to still, you know, investigate how secure they are when, you know, one can increase the key a little bit and then, you know, be secure for 10 more years or so? Well, let me give you a glimpse on um, how difficult these things are, you know, brute force uh, search. Let's say I'm using a system, symmetric key, just because it's faster. Um, I'm using a system like uh, AES, which um, uh, accepts uh, keys of 128 bits or 192. 128 is more common. Now, if I were using a, you know, such a system with 128 bits, and I'm using a computer or supercomputer, and let's say I'm searching brute force a billion, billion keys per second, 10 to the power 18 keys per second, that will probably take approximately 10,783 years. Okay? Well, I'll have a low beard by that time, but it's going to be quite difficult, okay, to do it brute force. Because you have to search through a space that has size doubly exponential. Two to the power, two to the power, whatever the key uh, size is. That's doubly exponential. That's quite big. Now, 192, which is the other version of AES, um, and let's um, assume that I'm, I'm actually searching like 1 billion, billion, billion keys, 10 to the power 18 keys per second, that will probably take approximately 10 to the power 32 years, right? Just to give you a you know, comparison or perspective on this. The expected life of the universe is between 10 to 12 up to 10 to 15. Okay? 10 to 12 up to 10 to 15. So that's, you know, a couple of universes old. <laughs> um, quite difficult. So, of course, you have to use your ingenuity and quite a bit of mathematics to be able to, you know, uh, comprehend or understand how the system works and what could the attack be. Okay? Um, I'm actually a cryptographer, not a cryptanalyst, although I, uh, I sometimes dabble in that as well. Now, modern keys, private keys, um, basically the, the uh, 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 
The idea behind it is that knowledge about the encryption key reveals the decryption key. As opposed to public key, what knowledge about the encryption doesn't reveal anything about the decryption. Well, unless you have happened to know the uh, trap door in there. Now, um, one of the uh, ingredients, main ingredients in any string cipher or block cipher is the fact that we're using the nonlinear feature somewhere. Something that is, you know, makes the system hard to uh, cryptanalyze. And these are actually tuples of what we call Boolean functions. Tuple, I mean, in other words, you have rows of these things um, used in the system, sometimes called substitution or S boxes, uh, but they are made up with what we, we have Boolean functions. Now, just repeat a couple of things here. We, uh, uh, some of us have seen on, on Wednesday, um, a Boolean function is nothing else than a, you know, a, 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 um, a polynomial, basically, uh, accepting um, you know, n input bits and outputting, outputting a bit. Um, there are various tools that one can use here, one of which is the Hamming weight and Hamming distance. Hamming weight and distance basically count the number of non-zero bits in the expressions. Okay? Um, again, I'm not going to do too much, uh, uh, you know, too many definitions here. We've seen them on Wednesday, and if I need them, I'm going to mention them later on. Now, as I mentioned, linearity is the worst nightmare of a cryptographer, and you'll see why. After today's talk, you'll be able to recognize what the linear function looks like. If a key happens to be linear, you'll be able to say it is linear. Or if the output of a cipher is linear, you'll be able to actually see it right away. Now, the nonlinearity or the linearity actually comes in many flavors, one of which is the degree of the polynomial representing the function. Of course, if the degree is 1, then it is linear or affine. By the way, we sometimes actually we use these interchangeably. You know, linear and alpha, although from a linear algebra perspective, they're not the same, right? <laughs> Wanting to shift to a linear function. Now, that's the classical notion. Now, there is an, uh, another notion, mostly used in crypto, uh, uh, on the crypto side of things, namely based on the Hamming, Hamming distance or, or weight. Is the minimum distance to the set of all affine functions. Simply put, is if I'm using this as a key, how many bits do I have to change? to replace it into a linear function or affine functions. Okay, that's the distance. Now, many of these crypto Boolean functions depend upon constructions of linear, you know, like concatenations of affine functions. Of course, not on the same dimension. Rather, you take smaller ones and you concatenate somehow, somewhat, somehow, to make it nonlinear. You know, just basically jumbling them a little bit. Okay? Of course, every bit is a linear function. Zero is a linear function. One is a linear function. So any string is a concatenation of linear functions. But you have to be a bit smarter than that. Now, how can we recognize linear affine or degree zero one functions? Again, that's actually very important. Um, I, I came up with this um, about 10, 15 years ago in my uh, uh, PhD thesis. And I actually didn't think that it's not known. And in fact, I called it the folklore lemma because, well, it was sort of, you know, it was circulating, well, not really circulating, but I couldn't believe that it's not known. It is also used in compression. And here's actually how we start. Let's say I'm giving you an n plus 1 link binary vector. I'm actually saying n plus 1 because I want to emphasize the fact that I'm defining a linear function accepting n input bits based upon n variables, if you will. So here I have 5. That means my n is 4. And I actually color coded them for a purpose. Now, here's how we can construct an affine function, and this construction also revealed the way we recognize them. Let's say I'm putting the first bit that shows up here as the first bit in my construction. Now, I'm going to scan this n plus 1 bit vector, and whenever I encounter a 0, I'm going to copy whatever I had before unchanged. Whenever I encounter a 1, I'm going to complement whatever I had before. So I'm scanning, I put a 0 down here, and then I, I have a 1. That means I'm actually going to complement what I had before. I'm scanning, I have a 1. That means I'm going to complement whatever I had before. I'm scanning, I have a 0. That means I'm copying whatever I had before. I'm scanning, I have 1. I'm complementing. That's a linear function. Well, is it linear or really affine? Actually, this bit that shows up in the beginning says whether it's a linear or a really affine or a shift. That zero says it's a, it's a linear. If it starts with one, that means it's actually affine. You have a plus one constant term in there. It's that simple to recognize linearity. As you can imagine, I mean, given this beautiful, and I think it's 
amazingly simple procedure. Basically, if you give me a string of zeros and ones, and I say, OK, I chop it up in half. Of course, it has to have a power of two, cardinal, right? Blend. I chop it up in half. I compare the first to the second half. Are they equal? If they are, I continue. But if they're not, I compare them to see if they are actually either equal or complemented. If they're not, I'm not dealing with the linear function. And you keep doing that on the first half and up, up until you get the bits. Of course, you know, that is that simple. So, what's the function here? Is this the is this the tree table of the function? Yes, that's the output of the function. Um, I'm basically running. I'm ordering z to the power n, the vector space, using the lexicographic order, starting off with zero, 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 and then zero, 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 one. Keep the one, and then I'm actually applying the function to every single bit, every single tuple, okay. and I'm reporting the output. So a function, a plane function can be regarded as a polynomial or as a true thing, as the output. Okay. That's right. So it's that simple. Now, this, I mean, as you saw here, even, well, somebody might ask, well, what about quadratic? Actually, I have a way to recognize any degree function. I know it's going to be a little bit more complicated. It's not going to be as simple, but it's going to be, you know, recognizable. We have a way to recognize any degree just by looking at the truth table and doing something there. We can, uh, we can come up with the degree of that. Now, this has been recognized as a witness. Either the degree, you know, algebraic degree, or the nonlinearity is a weakness. There are many attacks on strings and black ciphers that actually take that into account. Uh, linear differential correlation algebraic attacks. And this is the topic of my today's talk. Um, I mentioned something else uh, uh, on Wednesday. Now, one, this was invented in 2002, so it's actually it's not that old. We're still working hard on, on this uh, topic uh, currently. The main ingredient to actually assess the immunity of a combiner uh, against the algebraic attack is the algebraic immunity. Why is that? Let's say I'm using f as a combiner. You know, basically, I'm generating linearly, because I need fast, um, some bits. And then I combine them. I use them as inputs in a function. Right? That function is going to give the nonlinearity of the string cycle. Now, and that's my f in here. Here's what the algebraic community, you, you don't see the usefulness of this one at this stage, but I'm going to say it uh, next. I'm actually going to come up with or find the lowest degree polynomial that vanishes, that annihilates this f. Again, this a of f is the minimum degree of an annihilator of f or its complement. Even if you don't know anything about you know, how the attack would work, how the algebraic attack would work, this G actually gives me some information on the, um, on the, uh, the function F. Here's the information I'm, I'm going to get. F is the combiner. I don't know how it works or you know, what the input is. But every time F is 1, G must be 0. Let me repeat this. Every time F is 1, G must be 0. In other words, I'm going to get some information about how the system will work just by looking at this function G, at this NI here. Okay? Uh, just to give you an, an example, let's say I'm taking f to be x1, x2, x3 plus x1, x3. The algebraic immunity of this function, the function is, has degree 3, but the algebraic immunity is actually 1. So it's almost, even if I use f as a combiner and a cipher, that is as if I would work with a degree 1 function in a certain sense. Because this f stores not the same information, but almost the same information as the x2. Almost. Again, every time f is 1, g must be 0. The second component must be 0, <laughs> if you will. Um, now, there are legal results. We know, and this actually was uh, a result from 03 uh, um, by these things of people. If f is a Boolean function with n variables, then the algebraic community is bounded by the sinning of n over 2. In other words, even if you start up, even if you take a function that has a high algebraic degree, thinking that, oh, it's going to be great for differential cryptanalysis, um, the algebraic unit is like using a function that has degree up to and including n over 2 ceiling, which is fantastic, I think. Now, how would the attack work? So here's how it works. I'm using Kirchhoff's principle from the 19th century in the sense that I know how the system actually is implemented. I simply do not know the secret key. That's actually how we analyze mathematically and not only these systems. Let's say I, mean, I have a, uh, uh, a system of LFSRs given by some you know, generating function L, and then I filter this using a Boolean function. I'm feeding the output of the LFSRs 
linear feedback shift registers into a function, just to make it seem nonlinear. Okay? Some degree. Now, again, I don't know the secret key. It's red. Red means secret key. I don't know the secret key, but I can generate. I can generate the entire struct, the entire sequence. You know, I can. By the way, this is used not only for string ciphers, but this is sometimes used to generate keys for some other ciphers, for block ciphers. I mean, you have IVs, you know, injected into um, into block ciphers, so you have to be able to generate those, you know, IV sequences, and this is one way to do so. But they all seem, they all have to seem nonlinear, and that's a way to make them seem nonlinear. Um, the reason, re there is a reason why I actually say they seem nonlinear. Because everything, every single thing is linear, by the way, if you take sufficiently large uh, sequences. Right? Now, so I'm generating the entire structure. So Z0 is F of A, Z1 is F of LA, and keep going. They all are basically generated using the secret key and the two functions that, are, that seem to be, that actually are known. The cryptanalysis problem in this context is find the secret key A, the vector, knowing how you generate the LFSRs and knowing the combiner, exactly the expression of the combiner. Okay. Now, how would that work using just what we've seen so far? Well, I mean, the function could be, it has degree D, which means it could actually involve the entire, every single monomial of, the, of degree up to and including D. So in general, it actually can have as many you know, monomials, actually it starts from zero, but that's it's just one more if you will. So monomial, well, that means that if I have access to a sufficiently many you know, outputs, ZIs, then I form basically a linear system and I try to solve it. A linear algebra, very useful here. I try to solve it. Well, how difficult can this be? Well, believe it or not, the complexity is big O of n choose D raised to the power of omega. Omega is from some parameter given the, uh, the method that you use. By the way, the 2.376 is not really practical. It's just a theoretical result there. Not that it matters that much. If D is sufficiently large, close to N, N being, you know, say 128, this is completely out of our reach. We cannot solve that system, although we, you know, we get the linear system, okay? So is it possible to improve the complexity? And the answer is yes, and here's how we can do it, and this was event again in 2003, 2004. Let's say I'm intercepting ZI, right? I'm intercepting. I mean, it's very easy, right? Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or whatever the case may be. You intercept ZI. You have knowledge about the construction of the system F and L. You just don't know the secret key. So let's assume that I can intercept those guys. Now, if I have an annihilator G of F or F plus 1, doesn't matter, then what I can do is every time I intercept the 1, I'm multiplying by this value of G, by this value of G. Now. That means that G of L raised to the power I, L is known, G is known, right, and I letter, um, of some secret key that I don't know, it must be zero every time I intercept the one. What does that mean precisely? It means, well, again, I'm just, you know, uh, assuming that I actually generate in ZI as many as I want, right? I intercept them as many as I want. That means that if G doesn't have a high degree, I can actually find a secret key by simply using G, not F. By simply using G, not F. The complex actually was proven in 03 that it decreases from big O of N choose D to F to big O of N choose D, G. Again, G, D, the degree of the function G, and I learned, actually seems, I mean, it's assumed to be smaller, a lot smaller than, you know, the combiner that you started with. Um, you, you may think, well, does this work in practice? Actually, it works. Uh, Toyo Crypt was broken this way. Lily Stream Cipher was broken this way. Lily 128 actually was broken this way. And Toyo Crypt was broken this way. And there are some other ciphers which were broken for fewer rounds, not the full fledged 1,000 something rounds, rather 768 or whatever rounds. They were actually broken this way. <coughs> so, this is the algebraic community based attack. Find G with low degree. It doesn't have to be the lowest. I mean, if you have the time, you know, for some string cipher, and you know F, you can certainly do um, a little bit of work to find the lowest degree annihilator, but it's sufficient to find a sufficiently low G, sufficiently low degree G, which annihilates F or F plus 1. Okay? And then solve the induced linear system by, you know, intercepting sufficient many uh, key string bits. That's the attack. Now, any research problems? Well, certainly plenty. 
um, find ways to compute the algebraic community of a given Boolean function better than brute force. This is not as easy as it sounds. This is not as easy as it sounds. Even to find the, algebra, the uh, uh, algebraic community of some function, you still have to solve a system which takes quite a bit. But once you use that um, uh, combiner for multiple actually instances, then it actually, um, it's actually, um, it's, it's important to actually find an annihilator, even if it's not the lowest degree. And construct, the second research question is construct Boolean functions that are immune to algebraic or fast algebraic attacks, correlation, differential linear attacks. So this is a second one, and more people than uh, uh, ever actually are interested in this particular uh, research question. Find large classes like an atlas, like a database of such functions that satisfy as many properties, including high algebraic community, um, possibly optimum, optimum being the ceiling of n over two, to be used in uh, a stream of block cipher. So these are, um, these are uh, the questions. Now, about the uh, cube attack, this is a variation of an algebraic attack. This was invented you know, quite recently. It was actually invented in 07 and 08. I actually posted both of these up because there is a fight in the crypto community about who came up with what. So um, uh, Vielhaber actually says that uh, Dinur and Shamir actually copied them, his method. And the inertia here says, well, it's ours is a different attack. Regardless of who came up with that, and I'm not going to try to settle the, uh, the uh, uh, fight there, uh, both of them are the higher order differential attacks. And here's how the, uh, the thing works. Give an example. Much better to give an example than uh, anything else. So let's say I'm, I'm using f of x1, x2, x3, x4, which is given by that polynomial there. So here's what the attack actually works, how the attack works. I'm actually going to try to find large classes of, of, of monomials, in this case, say x1, x2, so that the cofactor of x1, x2 is actually a linear, a linear polynomial. The interesting part, and this is a theory behind it, that's the only theory actually in, this, uh, in, in here, in the Dinur and Shamir's paper, is the fact that if I <coughs> have access to the blue variables, I can come up with information about the red variables. Let me repeat this. If I have access to the black box, the function, the encryption machine, and I have a tweakable set of variables, like x1, x2 here, if I sum up, I don't know anything about this, the secret key, but if I sum up over every value of, of those blue variables, I come up with the cofactor. That's the theory, actually. This can be proven for any such. That was in, in, an, intriguing, uh, an intriguing, actually, idea. Now, how is that going to help me? Well, again, there is a debate on whether this works for full-fledged ciphers, but it's still something that one should take into consideration because it assumes that I have access to some part of the secret key. I can always use guess and determine you know, techniques. Um, I can have access to the part of the uh, uh, secret key, and I can find the other, the complement of that. Uh, that's how the attack works. Um, of course, in general, the idea is that we have to collect all of these linear you know, cofactors. If I have sufficiently many, I find the linear system, I solve it. Does it work? You always ask this question. I mean, I don't care about the theory. Does it work? Well, actually, it does work. It does work, uh, but I'm going to uh, end it here. We did use this attack. I'm not going to display the, uh, well, maybe I should. This is the Bluetooth uh, protocol. Bluetooth E0 protocol, it has four LFSRs based upon some primitive polynomials. And I asked one student of mine, like two months after the University posted their paper, I said, well, why don't you, master student, why don't, why don't you look at the uh, cube attack as applied to the Bluetooth uh, protocol? Um, the reason actually I, uh, I, I thought is, is going to be successful is because the Bluetooth protocol is actually described by this function. Is based upon a four-degree polynomial. It has 20 variables. And I said, how difficult can it be to analyze this damn thing? And the answer is not at all difficult. In fact, it was so easy that we ended up um, actually sh uh, showing that we can break Bluetooth in about 8.03 seconds on a Pentium 4 by Maple 12, not even a high-end programming language. <laughs> 
So we can, um, basically the idea is that if I have access to the first four variables and the last four variables, I can find eight more in, uh, not 8.03, this is the pre-processing phase. This is the something that I do it, uh, you know, in the comfort of my phone. The actual attack works in a fraction of a second. So I can find eight bits in a fraction of a second. Um, of course, any re research problems, plenty of research problems there. I proposed in uh, 2009, we, have a, we had our first cybersecurity workshop at MPS, and I proposed that the algebraic attack, the cube attack will work for grain 128, which is another cipher proposed by the counterpart Eastern, the European NIST, basically, which is a conglomerate of uh, countries there. And this was, uh, uh, this was done uh, this year by, the, by Shamir and, and uh, some of his uh, PhD students. Uh, they actually attacked Green 128 using the cube attack and a modification of this. So, thank you. Okay.